Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, Board of County Commissioners agenda meeting for Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. Uh, I'm John Hutchings, Chair of the Board, and to my left is Co-Chair or Vice-Chair uh, Gary Edwards, and to my right is Commissioner Ty Menser. To his right is La Bonita Bomar, the Clerk of the Board, and to her right is uh, Romero Chavez, our County Manager, and to his right is uh, Elizabeth Petrich, uh, our Deputy Prosecutor. Welcome, and I'll ask uh, Commissioner Menser to please lead us on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I look for an approval of the agenda or a motion. I would so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve today's agenda. Is there any changes or discussion? No, sir. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 We have an agenda and board meeting minutes from April 23rd and April 30, 2019. I would move to approve the board minutes from the 23rd and 30th of Second. 2019. It's been moved and seconded to a approve the uh, board meeting minutes from those two dates. Any discussion? No, sir. No. Nope. All in favor say aye. 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 That carries. That takes us to presentations, and the first one is Public Defense. Yes, Vets 2019 decal presentation and VERG report. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to be here, and I'd like to start by introducing the uh, 2019 Thurston County Veterans Employee Resources Group Steering Committee. Uh, I am as the chairman, Jose Vargas, uh, and right behind me here is Michelle. No, oh, right in the we got to talk right in the microphone, Jose. They won't hear you. Okay. Uh, we have Michelle Slaughter, who uh, is our new second sponsor for for 2019. Thank you, and I just want to say a few words. Um, again, I'm Shelley Slaughter. I am Director of Thurston County Public Health and Social Services, and I am so honored that this amazing group, the Veterans Employee Resource Group, asked me to serve as their executive sponsor. Um, and so happy to accept that role. Not only is this important to me because of the work that we do at our department, public health and social services, to improve the health and wellness of veterans in many of our programs, including the Veterans Assistance Fund program. But in my own life and in my own family, like I'm sure many of you, I have military family members um, and their families who have sacrificed a lot my, um, both my grandfathers and my uncle received Purple Hearts for the sacrifices that they made in World War II, Vietnam, and the Korean War. And I myself was formerly a veteran spouse, so I know the other side of what it's like um, to be uh, a family member of, of someone and what, what kind of toll that can take on a family and the resources and support that is needed. I am so humbled and amazed every day that I get to work alongside our employee veterans that have so many talents, they have wisdom, they have experience, they have skills, they have leadership, training, and courage and passion for what they do. And not only have they sacrificed and dedicated their lives to military service, but then they continue that by working for us here in Thurston County. And sometimes they do that simultaneously, working evenings and weekends for the military by day here at Thurston County, and they often get deployed. And uh, we just can't say enough about how much we value the employees that we have that are veterans. And I want to do everything that I can uh, to support them and uh, the success of the VERG and the amazing goals and things that they have um, for our veterans this uh, in this upcoming year. So thank you so much, and I'll pass it back to Jose to say a few more. Thank you. Um, the rest of the, the board, uh, or the rest of the steering committee, uh, Mr. Mar Mark Moffitt, also from Public Health and Social Services, he's our co-chair. Uh, Mr. Efren Morris from uh, ER&R &E uh, Fleet Operations. 
is uh, an our, our large member of the CERN committee. And our immediate past chair, uh, Mr. Wayne Jones from Human Resources. And uh, under Mr. Jones' uh, wonderful leadership, uh, we started the bird last year. Uh, we uh, conducted elections and, uh, for the steering committee. Uh, we conducted a veteran survey uh, for each, uh, the, to identify issues that affect our veterans' uh, employees. Uh, and we also started uh, quarterly meetings uh, last, uh, last year, which were very successful. Uh, we have several goals uh, for this year. Among them are uh, to continue the efforts to address uh, veterans' issues within the, the county employees, uh, to establish a, mem a mentorship program uh, for new veterans' employees within the county, uh, and to encourage uh, uh, the part more participation of veterans and non-veteran employees within the, the group. Those are uh, our major goals. And, uh, and one last, last thing before I, I introduce Ms. Our guests, uh, our next general general meeting will be on Wednesday, May 22nd, uh, right here in Building Building One, uh, Room 152, at 2 p.m. And we ha have the honor of uh, having uh, uh, Commissioner Hutchins uh, as our, our keynote speaker for the general meeting, and he's going to be addressing issues with veterans with uh, tra traumatic brain injuries and PTSD. So uh, we encourage everybody to attend. Uh, both veterans and non veterans to attend this meeting because those are very important issues. So, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. S uh, Stephen uh, Silverson. Uh, he's the local veterans employee representative for the Thurston and Lewis County. He's a business service representative uh, focused on working with business to help create employment opportunities for veterans. Today, what I'll be presenting is the 2000. Stephen, you got to get right up that mic, but I'm sorry. There you go. How's this? Yeah, perfect. Thank Good you. to go. Uh, so, like you said, I'm the local veteran employment representative, and I'm here representing recognition. What that is from our department, from Employment Security Department, is that we are recognizing Thurston County as an employer of veterans. Since 2016, for our records, what they've indicated is that 51 veterans have been hired to be working with Thurston County six so far this year and so through this program we are recognizing you and we're hoping to instill competition with other employers state private or any other public to say please hire veterans like what was previously previously said uh, they have skills they're disciplined they're committed they want a chance they want an opportunity to show their worth and so we're hoping that this program continues to instill that commitment to hire veterans and to be recognized for doing so and so for right now I have the decals here for 2019, so you can proudly display that on your front window. So thank you for giving me the time to come in today and speak to you. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you for hiring veterans. Thank you, Stephen, very much. Uh, any comment or? Uh, oh, well, I might ask, uh, well, I don't know, yes, Stephen, but uh, Jose, I know, is a veteran. Uh, uh, Stephen, are you a veteran also? Yes, sir. Marine. Marine. Oh, oh. Like well, you dad. won't hold that against him, will you, Jose? Uh, no, sir. What, what, what's your, uh, you did quite a career, didn't you? Uh, I'm sorry, sir? You did quite a career, didn't you? Yes, sir. You? I was, uh, up to the mic, up to the mic, Jose. Oh. Uh, I was both an Army veteran uh, for three and a half years and a Coast Guard veteran for 29 years. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank both of you for your service to this country. Very much. And Stephen, my dad was a Marine, so I won't take the Mickey out on, on the USMC on the court. <laughs> 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 Any comments or questions? Uh, the, is the VERG, uh, a, uh, like, is it part of a network of similar groups, and, or is this something that we created, or what's the well, uh, wider? I think the additional idea was, uh, you know, under Wayne, uh, he was the, the, the driving force to create the, the Veterans Employee Resources Group, but there's others uh, uh, which I personally have worked with uh, in the past. We had the, the State uh, Veterans Employee Resources Group, uh, and I also uh, rep uh, member of various uh, veterans uh, organizations throughout the county. Uh, so I also try to, every time I go to a meeting, I, I want to, I make sure to say, hey, Thurston County okay. Barracks here, you know, is very representative good. for the, you know, so. Thank you. Uh, it's very nice to be recognized as a county for hiring veterans and what we do for veterans. And Amazon, uh, there's many organizations that hire veterans, uh, not exclusively, but uh, in, in large part. 
And uh, there's another well-known organization that uh, started an initiative to hire uh, veterans and veteran spouses, because the spouses are uh, one of the highest unemployed um, uh, group. And so the goal of this organization was to hire 25,000 veterans and spouses by 2025. And right now they're at 23,000. And that's Starbucks. Starbucks. Makes me very proud. And the, one of our closest military Starbucks stores is in Lakewood right off the 512. And I'm told, I haven't seen it, but once you walk in, you're just moved with the artwork and the pictures and such. So thank you for the recognition. Greatly appreciate it. We do everything we can for veterans here. And we're Purple Heart County. And my son's a Purple Heart recipient. So it's very meaningful. So thank you very much, Stephen, Shelley, and Jose. Thank you. OK, let's clap. There we go. Uh, next presentation is uh, Human Resources Public Service Recognition Week Proclamation. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, Good afternoon, Maria. I'm glad to be here today to ask, do I need to speak? Well, that and introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Maria Ponte, uh, Human Resources Director. And I'm here today to ask you to uh, proclaim May 5th through May 11th Public Service Recognition Week in Thurston County to honor our employees. I think that my presentation doves well, uh, dovetails well into the presentation by the VERG. Um, each and every day our employees go above and beyond to provide a variety of services. And this year I'm glad to say we have 37 employees celebrating their five-year anniversary, five employees celebrating 10 years, 36 employees are celebrating 15 years, 23 employees are celebrating 20 years, 11 employees are ce celebrating 25 years, 14 employees are celebrating 30, and remarkably we've got one employee celebrating 40 years wow. with public health and social services, so that's an amazing dedication to public service. Their combined years of service equals 2,075 years of experience. So that's pretty darn amazing. So the proclamation affirms our support and recognizes the incredible contributions our employees make to the citizens of Thurston County. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. I don't think so. No, I don't have any either. Thank you for okay. all you do too, Maria, and keeping and I, I hope you heard this presentation about hiring military folks, being you're an HR person. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, wait, wait, wait. Uh, 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 uh. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, we have a proclamation to read. Proclamation. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> it's then, my first one, so forgive okay. me for not <laughs> understanding the process. <laughs> you're forgiven. Whereas Public Service Recognition Week is a time to honor the contributions of public employees at every level of government, and whereas Thurston County residents are impacted every single day by public employees who serve in many valuable ways, helping to make life better and striving to meet the challenging needs of a diverse population in a rapidly changing environment, and whereas day in and day out, Public employees provide the diverse services required to protect, support, and assist the residents of the county in order to provide a vibrant community. And whereas without these public servants at every level, continuity would be impossible in a democracy that regularly changes its leaders and elected officials. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Thurston County Commissioners hereby proclaim the week of May 5th through May 11th, 2019, as Public Service Recognition Week, and encourage all citizens to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of government employees at all levels, federal, state, county, and city, adopted the seventh day of May, 2019. Your Board of County Commissioners. Yeah. Now we have a uh, a presentation for you, proclamation for you, and a photo. <coughs> you thought you were done. <laughs> well, why don't we get some public employees to come up here? Of course, yes. Yeah. 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 We got a few of them. Come on, we got a few in the audience. Come on, Wayne. Come on. Come on, can't hide. Come on up. 
Scott, Vicky, come on. Vicky. Elizabeth, go with That's what you get for sticking around. Yeah. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Yeah, go back up. Is that the right one? Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is Spirit Week. Uh, the next uh, presentation is Emergency Services Proclamation, and we have Kurt Harden in the house. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Kurt Harden, Director of Emergency Services for Thurston County, which also includes Medic One. And I'm here to ask uh, that will you re uh, proclaim uh, May 19th to the 25th at uh, Celebrate EMS Week. Uh, Medic One, which is part of EMS, was established by a vote of the public 45 years ago. And EMS within Thurston County consists of 12 fire agencies, two private ambulance companies, two hospitals, one air ambulance company, uh, emergency management, and TCOM. There's approximately 550 emergency medical technicians or EMTs across the county and approximately 60 paramedics across the county. Many uh, are volunteers within their fire agencies as well serving as EMTs. And we find that many of the volunteers contribute in the equivalent of over $10 million in volunteer EMS services annually across the county. Uh, last year in 2018, there were 34,401 EMS dispatches across the county, and I'll let you know that that represents about 85% of all fire calls in Thurston County. Um, I would also say that this proclamation supports Initiative 5 under the strategic plan, which is strengthen emergency medical services provided countywide by Medic One and area hospitals from the county strategic plan. And so therefore, I'm here to answer any questions you have and also request that uh, you proclaim uh, May 19th through the 25th as EMS week. Questions or comments? No, sir, you do a good job. You're a fine representative of that community function. Excellent job, yes. I think, thanks. Good. We have a proclamation to read, or Gary does. Emergency Medical Services Week. Whereas, Emergency Medical Services is a vital public service that provides life-saving and supporting care to the citizens of Thurston County 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And whereas emergency medical services, including emergency physicians, nurses, first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, educators, dispatchers, administrators, and others give selflessly of themselves for the care and welfare of others. And whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills. And whereas the people of Thurston County recognize the need for and initiated a countywide emergency medical services system in 1974. And whereas access to emergency care dramatically improves the survival rate of someone experiencing illness or injury, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize, honor, and promote the value of the accomplishments of emergency medical services teams and the Thurston County Medic One Emergency Medical Services System by designating Emergency Medical Services Week, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners hereby proclaim the week of May 19th through 25th, 2019, as Emergency Medical Services Week and urges all citizens to join in this observance. Adopted the seventh day of May 2019, your Board of County Commissioners. Yay. Come on up, Kurt. Oh, Gary. There you can drop that. There you go, sir. Thank you. Yes. There we go.
Thank you. And I guess I'd like to point out the rest of the team would be here, but they're out there making sure we're safe. Right? That's right. They're out there cared for. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now that takes us to item number one on the agenda, and that is uh, opportunity for the public to address the board of county commissioners. <clears throat> The Board of Thurston County Commissioners welcomes comments from the public at all meetings. However, here are some guidelines governing such comments to ensure they are appropriate and don't take advantage of the fact that <coughs> these meetings are televised. Number one, when you're addressing the board, please address the board and, and look up this way, not in the audience and or staff. Um, this is a time for the public to uh, address the board, and so we are, we're not here to discuss, ask questions, verify, uh, get in debate and such. Is for a chance for us to listen. Um, however, on a needed basis, the county manager will follow up on specific items. Speakers are limited to three minutes uh, to address the board, and La Bonita Boom, our clerk, has the timer that'll show up here uh, on your uh, right. And it counts down. At the end of uh, your time, you'll hear a beep, and that means your time is up. Uh, if you're mid sentence, go ahead and finish, but please don't uh, take advantage of that because there's other follow uh, people that want to speak after you. Um, and meeting attendees cannot donate your speaking time to another uh, speaker. The board reserves the right to restrict a person's opportunity to address uh, the meeting for a good cause. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't yet. No comments that are lewd or offensive to a reasonable person. We ask you please be respectful. No outbursts of any kind. Uh, no comments that are commercial in nature such as a promotion for a for-profit business. Uh, all materials that you do provide to the, uh, to the uh, county manager or to the county may be considered public records subject to public release upon request pursuant to the Public Records Act, Chapter 42.56 of the RCW, and remarks about pending land use permits or similar matters that could eventually come before the board on appeal are not allowed as well. So with that, thank you. I have a list here. I have just one list. I don't know if there's another one or not. And what I'll do is I will call uh, the name for the speaker who's coming up and uh, the next one who's on deck and please uh, for the record state your name and about where you live and then you're off and running and the first one is uh, John Pettit followed by Terry Ballard good afternoon commissioners my name is John Pettit I live in East Olympia off Rich Road and thank goodness they're dumping about three million eight hundred thousand salmon fries off of my property into a little jump off area for kids. So we got some good progress. Uh, today, as you may know me, uh, I'm not always the most tolerant about certain things and I get very frustrated. Uh, I'm talking about several different things today and I'll end with a, a suggestion of a proposition that I would like to see because I was very pleased to see that the commission now wants to make sure the public has a right to vote. So. Uh, one of the ongoing issues that I've had has to do with the Transportation Benefit District. The Transportation Benefit District was started at the very end of 2014. It's existed clear up through now. Uh, it has never done a project. And uh, it has never uh, existed. It was supposed to be, uh, even by your own code, ordinances it was supposed to be eliminated once there was basically meeting any of the requirements for paying off debt and such uh, the only debt that's ever occurred is the debt that the county has invested to continue to keep something open that shouldn't be open at all and over the term of uh, four years of accumulation it came to 102,000 somehow for a district that's never done a project you spent $76,000 on it last year Wow but I do know why you're actually trying to keep it open, which is real simple. You have a little hidden tax agenda waiting for us for the second half of this year. I know that because I looked at the budget. You have a plan that you're going to collect $800,000 in taxes, which I presume has to do with trying to levy uh, license plate fees. All I want to do is see you guys start being very honest and open about the intention of future taxes. You already know I wasn't happy with what I was hearing, nor how the process is for the new uh, requested uh, county courthouse. So the, to close up, I'll finish up with reading what I would like to have you submit to the voters. 
If you don't want to do it, tell me what I need to do to motivate you to bring it to the attention. The proposition is similar to what you would have for like the county courthouse. The title would be limiting Thurston County Taxing District to increase of taxes and fees. The question would be, should the taxing district of Thurston County, Washington, be required to submit any and all tax fee, tax or fee increases to a 60% majority plus one vote of the electors of Thurston County prior to levy or increase of existing or future county ordinances which impose a tax or fee? I know that for sometimes we can get as low as eight people to sign or 10 people to sign a, a uh, request for a proposition. Let's put this in front of the people and let's let them have an opportunity to make a vote. We do want to include, we don't want to circumvent the voice of the people like what it appears is attempting to be happening on a county courthouse pro project. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Ballard followed by Howard Glassdetter. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Terry Ballard. I am a 35-year veteran with over 28 years of active duty. I reside in uh, Thurston County Unincorporated. I'm not here to talk about the uh, notes from the September 18th meeting you had, because there's nothing been accomplished. Whatever's been given to the board has met the black hole and um, I thank you very much for taking out the uh, response in your um, thing to tell us that you're not going to, res rather than you're going to respond to this, maybe it's at a meeting that nobody can, uh, nobody shows up at since two o'clock or, uh, or it's just going into the black hole and you never see it and you never worry about it because you're not here for the people, you're here for your staff and he belongs to staff uh, he's responsible for staff, and you are responsible for him. Illegally, everything to go on. Uh, next, why are we, we, we came up to a building that we bought here earlier, and that was building six. And I have documentation that says that building six was used, going to be used as a, uh, a new courthouse. Well, we bought it, it was such in, in dire repair, we never actually used Building 6 for what was mentioned for Building 6. For the reuse of Building 1, Building 2, Building 3, and Building 5, and a total rebuild of Building 6 for a new courthouse, for Building 1, 2, 3, and 5, the same company that you continue to choose, okay, Chose the um, uh, chose the rate of seventy nine million four hundred and forty seven thousand to reuse all those buildings and another hundred and sixteen thousand eight hundred and fifty five to build a building six. Why are we spending an extra hundred thousand dollars to build something on property that we do not own? And by the way, that's where the tiny home camp is. It has a problem of wetlands, it has a problem of Moxie Creek going under it and dumping into, uh, dumping with the stormwater unfiltered into uh, Bud Inland. It has some major problems, but this one doesn't have major problems, and we already own it, even though it's in dire repair and it was ba basically set for teardown. So we, we buy a building for, uh, we buy a building for uh, 3.2 uh, 3 million, okay, and, and uh, and it's worth much less than that, and that would be the Swanson's factory. We buy, buy building two for um, uh, 1.8 million, but at the time it's 1.2, and now it's now it's uh, uh, worth 967,000. We seem to buy buildings without formal appraisals. We need to get back on uh, on track. And just one quick thing in note. <coughs> You need to read RCW 84.55.050. It tells right. you that your, uh, uh, your new uh, expansion of taxes will be voted, will be voted in a general election. Pacific to a district, it would be voted in a special election, but this is not Pacific to a direct Thank you, to a, uh, uh, election. So the whole proposition excuse me, again, is illegal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Howard Glassdetter, followed by Paula Holroyd. Um, 
My uh, name is Howard Glastetter. I've been a Nisqually Valley resident for 50 years. Uh, Thurston County is about to update the Nisqually, the 1992 Nisqually Valley sub-area plan. Uh, this plan was originally put uh, out as a response to the Washington State Growth Management Act. And um, so the first meeting we had for the update or that the, pub, the potential uh, attendees <coughs> were invited to was March the 1st. So it's a little over two months ago. Um, Maya Temple will be, or te if I pronounce it right, Tep Teeple will be here May 15th to discuss this plan with you folks. Um, and she uh, pointed out to us <clears throat> that the, the next meeting would occur after the Board of County Commissioners, you folks, decide uh, whether we would be in, we or whoever is chosen to uh, be on the committee would be an advisory group, uh, as in 1992, and have some decision making, or a stakeholder group, which is a group that just offers feedback and viewpoints. Um, the volunteer uh, attendees of the March 1st meeting voted eight to one to be an advisory group uh, and have a say in what the final plan will look like. Two, uh, two of the attendees were original members of the 1992 plan, Jim Myers and Joe Cushman. Um, and these were on the original 1992 sub-area plan. The 1992 plan had much to do, it's not perfect, but it had much to do with preserving the Squally Valley, and I hope you folks will consider making the current committee, whoever that happens to be, an advisory group. Any questions? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Glasser. Paula Holroyd, followed by Toby Jewett. Good afternoon, Commissioners yeah, Edwards, Hutchings, and Menser. I am Paula Holroyd, the Chair of the League of Women Voters Thurston County Water Study. The League of Women Voters believes resource management decisions must be based on a thorough assessment of population, growth, and current and future needs. Therefore, the League of Women Voters of Thurston County urges the County Commissioners to fund a long-range water ability availability study. We re recommend Mr. Chavez and Mr. Cummins work with the Department of Health and Public Works to develop a budget. The study should include assessment, monitoring, and planning for water resources in Thurston County for the long run, built on the work of the RIAs. It should include major water banking, considerations should be taken for forest preservation and water conservation needs. Stream water temperatures and flow rates necessary for fish restoration should also be considered. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Toby Jewett? Is Toby here? There we go. Afternoon, gentlemen. Afternoon. Um, Toby Jewett. Uh, Shinky Road, South Bay. Move that mic. There you go. Thank you. Sir. Anyway, so I just wanted to touch on a few things today. Um, I'm not going to be available to be here for your um, uh, emergency ordinance adoptions, but I want to talk to you all about what's going on in South Bay right now and what we're worried about coming down the pipe. So at this moment, the last couple years, and I've little history I born and raised there going on 40 years most crime you would see would be an occasional um, car chase through South Bay or a few pullovers for DUIs a little domestic here and there not a lot of major theft the last couple years we're facing a lot of home invasion we're facing a lot of burglary crime is up crime is up heavily and for a lot of the folks that are out there, we all believe it's from a lot of the vagrant population that has moved out into the county. So 
what I would ask you for today. And basically, um, how do you expect us to take more crime by moving self-regulated homeless camps into our area? Um, why do you plan on sending these problems to North County when we're relatively crime-free, benign, we stay to ourselves, we do our own thing? Um, if you intend to make that happen and you do move these camps out here, what are you going to do to police them? How many more deputies are you going to put on duty to protect us? At this point, we have one deputy that runs day night, or daytime in the South Bay area from Nisqually to downtown Olympia. That covers a lot of territory. One deputy can't do it all. I've spoken with him. He's very unhappy. So if we're going to move these new residents, let's say, into these camps, how are we going to take care of that problem? Because the people who live out here are not going to take it. They're going to stand up and protect their property, and there will be blood on your hands. It's not a threat. I'm just stating some facts. Um, could you please take some time, maybe talk with the city of Lacey, find out if they've got another location that would work better. In our backyard, in an urban growth boundary that is the county, it's not going to work. It's just going to bring more crime and more violence to our area that we now already have an increase in crime in. So I appreciate anything you can do to help us with that, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in finding a good compromise. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are you taking off or sticking around, Mr. Jewett? Fine. Because uh, you and I have been in contact about this, yep. and uh, will, you, will you have any follow-up to that comment later, maybe next week or so? There's some background I want to provide you, because uh, I was up there this last weekend taking pictures and looking at, at uh, some sites. Yeah, and, I look forward to that additional information. Okay, and quite frankly, I couldn't find anything. I talked with several people up there to include the fire department, mm -hmm. South Bay Fire. I couldn't locate it, so any help would be appreciated. Now, the, that exhausts the list that I have. Is there another, anybody sign up on another list back there? Josh, can you check for me real quick, please, or do you have it? There are um, a couple of names here that signed up for the public hearing. Oh, public they might, hearing? Yeah, no, I don't need that might yet. be probably wanted to justify today. Okay. Just, just in case. Well, the public hearing will be at 3.30, 3 o'clock, oh. 3 o'clock, right after this. Um, but I want to ask is if anybody uh, would like to address the board that hadn't signed up, and you haven't spoken already, you're welcome to come on up and address the board on, uh, on a topic. Anyone? Yes, yes, certainly. Certainly, sir. I'm on your side up here. You're up here? Well, that one out there. I can get out of here then. Are you Robert? My name's Dennis. Pardon? Never mind, got you wrong. Oh, my name's Dennis Zek. I live on Shanky Road as well. Okay. Uh, to address what Toby just stated, uh, moving Kamets out into the county, uh, it seems to me that the city of Olympia is pressuring the cities and the counties to take some of the burden of what's going on with the homeless situation. And I can understand why. They've got 99% of it. But I also see that when you've got a homeless situation, they current, it's contained. Right now, if you start moving it into the cities and the counties and moving it around, you're just going to draw more people in. It's kind of the Yellowstone theory. They tell you not to feed the bears because it brings more bears. <laughs> it's what y'all are going to do. So we're not heartless. We know there's a problem. We have a population of 231,000 in Thurston County. We're talking 835 people that you've identified in your statement here, another 1,600 kids. So there's uh, 2,500 people out of 231,000. It seems to me it's more efficient and better for the people if it's a contained issue. If you spread it around, the word's going to get out to the other communities. Olympia's taking them. We're going to get more. And it's like, we don't need that. Olympia's been a beautiful place. I've lived here 62 years. And what I see when I go downtown Olympia, I won't go there anymore. It's disgusting. And they've allowed it. These people are not held accountable. Their campsites are absolutely disgusting. I mean, I wouldn't let rats live in there. So I, to let that spread throughout the county, I think if the county goes with that, horrible mistake. 
and you're going to see the degradation of the lifestyle of this particular region continue to, to decline. Just as you see it in Seattle, it's going to spread. And you guys have, you know, I don't envy you at all. It's a horrible situation that has to be handled. I don't know the answer to it. But I think spreading it to further in parts of the county, I think, is the wrong way to go. I think you contain it. You're able better to manage it. And that's what it needs to happen. It needs to be managed, and these people need to be held accountable. If we're going to help them, they need to be taking care of their place. They need to, there, there has to be some responsibility there. You have a lot of people that just don't want to participate in life. Well, I don't want to follow the speed limit, but I kind of have to. So hold them accountable. Help take care of them, without a doubt. But don't disperse them. You're just going to create a, a huge problem we're never going to get a handle on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else that hasn't signed up that would like to uh, come up and address the board? Yes, yes. I wasn't going to speak, but I will. My name is Lisa Gelati, and... Um, Lisa, can you spell your last name for yes, me? Yes, absolutely. G-I-L-L-O-T-T-I. -L -L -T -T -I. Thank you. And I want to speak to uh, the issue of homeless encampments. Um, that they've been speaking about as well. Um, myself, I could be, I'm within $100 of homelessness, and there's a lot of people in this, in this state, in this county, that are in that place. I'm on Social Security Disability. The income is not meeting the housing. So what happens to me? What happens to those of us that are just like me? A single accident or injury or health issue could take me homeless and I'm in my car. Where else would I go? So I think it's important to be recognized as human beings. We are all in this together. Some have more money than others. And a lot of it isn't choice. I didn't choose this. I would not have chosen disability for my life. It happened. I came to the point where I couldn't think anymore at my job. It's important to take care of human beings and be recognized as that. You are heart, you are people. Thank you. Ma'am, about where do you live in the county? About what area? I live in Thurston County, unincorporated Lacey. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> No, no, no outburst from the um, crowd, please. Thank you. Anybody else want to address the board? Thank you. Uh, item number two on the agenda is the county manager's update. Um, yes, I have a couple of updates for you, commissioners. Uh, first of all, uh, today we receive um, the certificate of good practice from the county road administration board. And um, just to give you some background on that, uh, the certificate is good practice has been transmitted to the state treasurer on behalf of, of, of Thurston County pursuant the authority contained with RCW 3678090 as shown on the certificate enclosed. This action by the County Road Administration Board will ensure the continued distribution of your monthly gas taxes allotment uh, to the, from the office um, of the state treasurer. This is a, a, a yearly certificate. Uh, they, we always work hard to do it. Uh, it requires for us to uh, be diligent as to how we use our, our gas tax dollars. And it's also, it takes diligence as to how we maintain our roadways. So this is kudos to, to the county, kudos to Public Works. And I will be sharing this with the staff, uh, with the director when I have the chance. Well, that's good news. And um, also, let me give you some, uh, some of the highlights of the uh, meetings that you participated uh, this past week. Um, on Thursday, May 2nd, uh, you had a, a, a good briefing related to comp the compliance process as to how we go through the process of, um, of uh, addressing new properties in the county and the overall compliance with the county code. Uh, on May 2nd, 1 in the afternoon, you had your, you had your monthly, monthly Superior Court update. 
Uh, at three in the afternoon, you had the opportunity to attend the 2019 annual State of the Tourism meeting. And six in the afternoon, you had a joint meeting with the, your fellow elected officials from the Lacey City Council. And uh, yesterday, uh, Monday, Monday, May 6th, um, you began a series of uh, events uh, to celebrate Public Service Recognition Week, where uh, um, all of you participated in many different visits to the different offices and departments. And, uh, and I believe we will complete the visits uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity to say thank you personally to county employees. And as far as I know, they really appreciate that uh, coming from you. That's all I have for you today. All right, thanks, sir. Takes us to item number three on the agenda, consent items A and B. Is there a motion? <clears throat> Yes, I'd preface that motion with these items have been discussed ahead of time at a work session. I would move to approve consent items A and B. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve consent items A and B. Is there any discussion? No, sir. No. Nope. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 That carries. Uh, department item number four. Uh, agenda item number four is the Department of Public Works Interlocal Agreement with the City of Tumwater for Striping and Roadway Maintenance. Scott. Welcome, Scott. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Commissioners. Uh, so I'm Scott Davis with the Thurston County Public Works Department, and I'm here regarding uh, uh, interlocal agreement with the City of Tumwater for roadway maintenance activities. And so uh, we, uh, we perform various activities for the City of Tumwater, mostly striping and pavement markings. Um, in the past, we've also performed uh, pavement repair activities, such as dig outs and, and patching and whatnot. So in order to perform these services, we have to have an interlocal agreement with the City of Tumwater. And so um, we've had, uh, this is a third, vari third, uh, third uh, uh, variation of the agreement. The first one uh, was signed in 2009, and then we renewed it in 2015. So this renewal was initiated by City of Tumwater about a year early um, for two reasons, uh, or one main reason. One is they wanted to increase the limit for roadway resurfacing work. The city wishes to uh, partner with the county on uh, on resurfacing and chip seal projects where they feel they could have some cost effectiveness uh, on roads that were similar to county roads, you know, essentially two lane roadways, more ruralish roadways. And so uh, so there's two main differences in this um, in this agreement than the previous uh, previous one from 2015. One is um, the agreement is, is, uh, would be good for 10 years versus previously five years. And then there's an additional light item for payment for specifically roadway resurfacing activities or pavement management activities uh, up to 500,000, which previously the limit was 100,000 for the entire agreement. Uh, and I think that's, uh, and that's it. And so one of the a few things we do do, like I mentioned, striping. So we stripe all their roads annually and then do upgrade and update some of their crosswalks and some of those other markings are the primary work that we do for them on a regular basis. Is there any questions? Any questions? No, sir. No. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I would move to approve the interlocal agreement with the City of Tumwater for striping and roadway maintenance activities. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the interlocal agreement with the City of Tumwater for striping and roadway maintenance. Any further discussion? No, sir. No? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Good 4B, afternoon. you're welcome, Scott. 4B is a release of an easement for Albany Street Pond Project. Craig. Thank you, Commissioners. Yes. My name is Craig Siss, and I'm the Real Estate Services Manager with Public Works. This release of easement is for a drainage easement as part of the negotiations for the Albany Street Pond Project currently underway in the Rochester area. The release is for the easement acquired by Thurston County in 1982 as part of a larger drainage plan for the Little Rock Albany Street area. The drainage system is no longer utilized by Thurston County and the easement in question is no longer necessary. The proposed release is a formality in order to clear title for the adjacent property owner. The Albany Street Pond project will replace the existing stormwater conveyance pipes and construct a stormwater infiltration pond. The stormwater currently discharges to a ditch to the north northwest of the pond site. The proposed emergency spillway discharges to the same dish, ditch a short distance downstream of the existing discharge point. Thurston County is acquiring a permanent easement for the long-term placement and maintenance of the emergency spillway. 
as part of the negotiation with the property owners, they have asked for the release of easement to re be recorded as a portion of their compensation. The existing easement and the new easement are located on the same parcel, however, they are in different locations. This action is part of the negotiations for a project supporting Initiative 8 of the County's strategic plan to support robust and well-maintained infrastructure systems for a thriving community. Are there any questions? No, sir. No. Nope. I, yeah. I, I would point out that uh, there was a good presentation on this at our last week's meeting in Rochester by staff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would move to approve the release of easement for the drainage easement acquired by Thurston County in 1982 as part of the negotiations for the new emergency spillway easement to be acquired for the Albany Street Pond project. Second. It's been moved and seconded to release uh, the easement for Albany Street Pond project. Any further discussion? No, sir. No. Nope. No. Nope. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Craig, very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. 4C, contract award for the Tabaton Creek Culvert Replacement. Welcome, Steve. Good afternoon. I am Steve Johnson, Thurston County Public Works, civil engineer. Uh, on May 1st, 2019, a total of eight bids were opened for our Tabaton Creek Culvert Replacement Project. That's project number 61492. The low responsive bidder is BPCI Earthworks LLC of Puyallup, Washington, in the amount of $606,642.50. Construction and county administration and inspection costs will be funded using the REIT II funds allocated for the Fish Passage Enhancement Program uh, for this biennium. I, would, I do want to mention part of the design was, uh, there was there was contribution from the Nisqually Tribe and uh, South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group. Uh, to help fund the design of this project, but construction costs will be fully funded by the Fish Passage Enhancement Program. This project will replace the existing culvert crossing beneath uh, Peisner Road at Tabaton Creek, which is a tributary of the Nisqually River. We will install a new 16-foot, 8-inch aluminum box culvert mm. and also reconstruct a portion of the stream, uh, primarily within the public right-of-way, although we do have some temporary easements outside to allow for uh, temporary uh, traffic bypass and stream bypass. The removal of this partial barrier will enhance uh, and, and partially restore uh, salmon access to more than half a mile of Tabaton Creek that would be up to the next barrier along the creek. And this includes uh, very large areas of high quality wetland habitat which would be great for salmon rearing. This project is in the current budget and the capital facilities plan and is in alignment with the county st strategic plan and initiative eight. Uh, do you have any questions? No, sir. No. Isn't this like a triple crown? Oh, just a second. Okay. Uh, or a trifecta or something. There's like three. Currently, there are three culverts. Yes, it's three a culverts. shallow. It's a it's a shallow cover, so the the stream is pretty close to the to the grade of the road, uh, but there's a large amount of flow going through these three culverts. Um, so the culverts don't flood because we have three of them, but that spreads that creek out too wide, which actually allows in low flow events, that water level is too shallow, shallow for yeah. the fish to go through. So what this will do is, is reconcentrate that water in a box culvert so the stream can act more like a stream instead of spreading out too far. And then in high flow events, we'll have plenty of uh, ability for the flow to go through without flooding the road. I love it. I love it. Yes, sir. Uh, and as Steve mentioned, uh, this is a continuation of, of the fish bait removal program the county has. And uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, Commissioner Hutchins and myself had the opportunity to attend the American Public Works Association, the state conference, where that program uh, won the state award and, uh, and is also scheduled to be a, a national award in September by the same organization. The reason that I mention in this is uh, Steve didn't have the chance to attend uh, that conference. And just, I, I just want to make the point, the importance of his role on, on how successful these programs are. So thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Not only a state award and a national award, but we still, Thurston County leads the state in fish barrier removals. That makes Correct. me very proud. And I, perhaps we'll read it in the paper someday. <laughs> it, it, it has been in several times. I, I would like to mention that, uh, that, that the appreciation is reflected back, the, the leadership and the direction and support from our commissioners and recent past commissioners as well has been very much appreciated. 
Well, and seeing, seeing the, uh, the response from our tribal partners, and they're just elated to see the fish come back. It's beautiful. Is there a motion? I would move to award the contract for the Tabatin Creek Culvert Replacement Project, number 61492, to BPCI Earthworks LLC for a total amount of $606,642.50, and to authorize the Director of Public Works to execute the contract and any change orders for this project due to unforeseen conditions only not for changes in scope, up to 20% of the contract, $121,329, or an aggregate of $727,972. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to uh, award the contract to Devonton Creek Culvert Replacement Project 61492. Any further discussion? No, sir. Nope. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. And uh, this being public service recognition week, please pass on to all your cohorts and to Jennifer our great appreciation for this. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That takes to item number five on the agenda, which is the county manager's items. Yes. Um, would you like to report on your activities and then it's my turn or? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You want to go first? Go ahead. Of the week. Okay. Uh, starting with the last meeting, uh, Thursday, as, as Ramiro indicated, I attended the uh, State of Tourism um, Board annual meeting. On Friday, uh, I got a presentation from WSU Extension at the fairgrounds and a tour of some of the programs they're working on. Um, on Saturday, I attended Olympia's Homeless Workshop in West Olympia Capital High School where the community sat in work groups and discussed key issues related to a homeless response. On s Monday, yesterday, I attended the opioid task force, uh, task force response meeting where we're finalizing a plan that will come to the Board of Health in June. Um, and then this morning I attended a uh, fundraiser for uh, Thurston County Volunteer Legal Services. My week uh, consisted of uh, water issues, biosolid issues that we're trying to prevent contaminating the water, and uh, the homeless activity that we are embarking on. That's it. Okay. I'm going to be quick. I was uh, given a unique opportunity to work uh, behind the bar at Starbucks, learned how to make uh, a couple of drinks, and uh, interacted with the public. Didn't touch any money or handle any money, and it was fun and engaging. I learned quite a bit. And that's where I learned about the veterans and spouses hiring program that Starbucks has embarked on. They've hired 23,000 veterans and their spouses to date. Uh, and uh, yesterday, I uh, worked with uh, County Manager Romero Chavez and others, and we did a Employee Appreciation Week cookie delivery to District Court, Sheriff's Office, CPED at the fairgrounds and WSU Extension. Uh, Public Health and Social Services, Medic One, and the Commissioner's Office to show our appreciation for all the work our county employees do. This morning, I also attended the uh, Thurston County Volunteer Legal Services annual fundraiser, very important uh, group uh, attending to our democracy and people's rights. And this evening, uh, the county manager and I, I don't say we have a date, but we'll be in Yelm tonight. And you're probably going to talk about that, aren't yes. you? Yes. Yes. That's it. It's all yours now. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you. Uh, here in a minute or less, you will have a public hearing where you'll be considering public testimony uh, on an emergency housing ordinance uh, as of the interim regulations uh, in, in an attempt to address homelessness in the county. And also, six in the afternoon, Commissioner Hutchins and myself will be attending the Yelm City Council to provide a, uh, uh, give a presentation related to the courthouse project in Regional Administrative Center, by the way. Uh, on Wednesday, May 8th, tomorrow, you will be attending the Thurston uh, County Chambers Annual Meeting, which is going to be located on the Hotel RL, just down the road. Uh, Thursday, May 9th, you will have your regular commissioner's check-in. An agenda will be posted 24 hours in advance. And at noon, you will have the opportunity to have uh, 
uh, meeting, uh, lunch meeting with your appointed directors. Nothing for the rest of the week, nothing for Monday. On your combined schedule, you may have individual appointments on your individual calendars, however. And then we'll come back here May 14 to review the agenda of that day. That's all I have for you. All right, thank you, sir. Is there anything for the good of the order? No? Oh, no. this meeting's adjourned. Now we're going to move right into the public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> right into the public hearing. Um, and as people are filing in, it gives me time to regroup. I've got some public comments for you. This is a public hearing uh, regarding uh, uh, emergency housing ordinance interim regulations. And we have uh, uh, Ian Leftcourt, associate planner, is going to be giving us a briefing on this. And I'm ready. We're ready. There's a sign up sheet in the back if you haven't signed up, if you want to testify. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to present today. We're going to be talking about a proposed emergency housing ordinance with interim regulations and to take public testimony on that proposition. Currently, homeless encampments are permitted as a temporary use in Thurston County and the Lacey, Tumwater, and Olympia unincorporated growth areas. The proposed ordinance was modeled on Olympia's similar emergency housing ordinance that the city adopted in July 2018. The proposed amendments would change the Thurston County Zoning Ordinance, the Zoning Ordinance for the Lacey Urban Growth Area, the Tumwater Urban Growth Area Zoning Ordinance, and the Olympia Urban Growth Area Zoning Ordinance. The proposed interim regulations are to address Thurston County Resolution Number H2-2018, which declared homelessness to be a public health crisis. The proposed interim regulations are not intended to be a major review and update. The Growth Management Act, RCW 36.70A.390, allows interim zoning ordinances to be effective for up to one year if a work plan is developed. A public hearing is required for interim zoning regulations, and the proposed interim ordinance may be renewed in six-month periods if the board holds a public hearing uh, prior to the renewal. At this time, I'll give a brief breakdown of what and what not the interim regulations would allow. Upon adoption of an emergency resolution by the board, the proposal would allow the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development, or their designee, to waive certain requirements for the encampments in consultation with affected parties and agencies, such as uh, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services, law enforcement, fire districts, host agencies, and property owners. As proposed, the following county requirements could not be waived. Screening for portable toilets, complying with building codes and fire safety requirements, creating a code of conduct from the host agency, checking identification with the sheriff's office for sex offenders and warrants, and that the sponsoring agency would self-manage and self-police the uh, encampment. As proposed, all other county requirements for emergency homeless encampments could be waived at the discretion of the director designee. This ordinance does not waive anything. It allows in an emergency the opportunity to waive specific requirements. Some of those examples that are relevant include the limit on residents of the homeless encampment. Currently, that is limited to 40 residents. Uh, the duration would also be something that could be waived. Currently, we are limited to 180 days of each homeless encampment. Parking, currently no off-site parking is allowed. And a big one is location and size requirements. Currently, encampments are limited to 1,000 square feet. They are limited to one encampment per sheriff's district, and there can be no more than two encampments at the same time in the unincorporated Thurston County. The city of Olympia adopted and enacted similar emergency ordinance to allow their community to address the homelessness crisis in a timely manner back in July 2018. The list of requirements that may not be waived was developed in consultation with uh, the board, various departments, and city of Olympia planning staff. Thurston County Community Planning and Economic Development has been working with all these departments and will continue to work with these departments, agencies, and property owners to find the solution that best captures our uh, community. Currently, the public interim regulations have received 32 public comments that are directly addressing the ordinance itself. 23 support the ordinance, 8 are against the ordinance, and one was seeking more information about the ordinance. 
Uh, some of the common questions we've received in the public comments. Question one, have we picked a site? No. This ordinance does nothing about picking a specific site. It is merely a changing, possibly changing the process for permitting an already existing temporary use. Another question that popped up frequently, will the ordinance change how homeless people are regulated? Again, this is only for permitting the encampment. If they abide by all the same laws that would incur normally right now. What powers and authority does law enforcement have to remove squatters from my property? Again, this emergency housing ordinance does not change how any of that will be regulated outside of the homeless encampments. Two big themes came from the public comments. The first one from people against it, uh, they, there was typically less focus on this specific ordinance and more a, a concern about using public resources to address homelessness services at all. For uh, the second theme, people who were in support of it generally identified that they supported low barrier to entry policies for the homeless encampment. That means lowering the threshold required to allow residents into the camp. Uh, thank you for your time and I will now answer any questions. Any questions? Tonight? Yes, uh, so you said that our draft ordinance is was was worked on with City Olympia staff, right? Correct. They provided and, input. And you said it was modeled on it in some way? Correct. But there's differences, right? Correct. It is suited can, to the county itself. Can you is it is it is it a can you succinctly identify how our proposed ordinance would differ from Olympia's? Or is that too complicated? That's a bit of a complicated question. I would be happy to provide a comprehensive list and mail that to you. Are there any like sort of, without being comprehensive, are there any key differences that, that would, put, that touch on issues that the public has commented on that you would anticipate would have pub, be a public concern? Just no. so, it, it may influence people's things they want to talk about in the in testimony is why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not review their code okay. very thoroughly. Fair enough. I'm not equipped to answer that at this Got time. Got it. Okay, go ahead. I guess I'd like to follow up on my fellow commissioner's request. I'd mm -hmm. like to see that comparison, if you will. I think that's a referred to. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on law enforcement's interaction in this process. Mm -hmm. You just said there was some way about warrants or maybe sex offenders. I don't, I don't know. I missed part of that. Maybe you elaborated more than I caught, but could you comment a little more on that? Absolutely. One of the areas of discussion was on whether or not <laughs> residents allowed into campaigns should be able to <clears throat> come in without getting checked or with. And so that was one of the requirements that is currently in Thurston County Code. You must check for ID and check for warrants in sex offenders. Discussions between the Sheriff's Office and PA, uh, Public Health and Social Services, we collaborated together and as proposed in this draft, not available to waive. So no matter what, under this proposed ordinance, ID checks will occur for sex offenders and outstanding warrants. Uh, do you know if the term APHIS has been utilized at all? I know Tumwater has what's called an APHIS equipment. It's, a, uh, it's the ability through a thumbprint to identify nationally uh, individuals. Have you it's automated, any? automated fingerprint identification system. Yeah, I mean, have you discussed that, which seems to be a pretty sure way of doing business. Uh, that is not represented in this proposed ordinance, but if Keeley's here, we could discuss how it applies generally. Uh, I, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is how are we going to know mm -hmm. that the individual being asked who they are, how that information is true and correct. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. And that methodology would have to be an ongoing discussion that is not represented in the ordinance. It merely states that we will conduct those checks. If we want to include specific language, staff would be happy to explore that. Okay. Let me follow up. Yeah, go ahead. So, Ian, um, you talked about checking to see if someone's a sex offender. Mm -hmm. Is that because we want to know if they're a sex offender, or is it because they're going to be excluded from the camp on that basis? The principle of the zoning is based on safety safety first as to the qualitative interpretation of that i cannot speak to however whoever will be making those decisions again i speak only for the process that we are updating itself 
for the permitting of a temporary use. But I'm just asking about the language of the ordinance, not, mm -hmm. not the values or the policy, but does the ordinance is what I'm hearing is mm -hmm. silent about what we do with the information. So we, we, the ordinance says we have to collect the information. You have a prior conviction for a sex offense. It doesn't say then what we do with that information. I will quote that. The sponsoring agency will use identification to obtain sex offender and warrant checks from the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. If said warrant and sex offender checks reveal either one, an existing or outstanding warrant from any jurisdiction in the United States for the arrest for the, of the individual who is the subject of the check, or two, the subject of the check is a sex offender, the sponsoring agency will reject the subject. Okay, so, so we will not allow them at the, at the mitigation camp. Correct. And then they'll go where? They'll be in the woods somewhere? They will not be at the site. Okay. My, uh, and my question is pretty simple, but it's along the same lines. You, you were pri provided information and numbers on the folks that uh, wanted high barrier versus low barrier. Mm -hmm. Was there any uh, request for no barrier? Not that I recall, but certainly I would as um, low, no barrier could be included in low barrier and vice versa. Okay, just wanted to know if that was separated out at all. Okay, any further? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, any talk about them, <clears throat> the participants in the program being able to utilize any type of drugs or alcohol on one of these sites? The code of conduct would manage that. And that means no? I believe so. OK. Yet to be determined, maybe? I believe so. Uh, I've, had con I've had contact with the sheriff who is concerned about that type of activity and identifying these individuals rather than just <laughs> by taking their word for it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm coming with that. OK, good enough. Anything further? <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Ian, very much. Thank you. And uh, now the public hearing is now open. And we'll open it up for uh, public comment. Oh, we got peeps more. Good. All right. And in doing so, there's a, a few rules for engagement. The Board of County Commissioners, we welcome the comment from the public at all meetings. However, there's some guidelines that need to be covered. Uh, thank you. For uh, uh, to ensure that they're appropriate and don't take advantage of the fact that we're being televised. Number one, please uh, silence your cell phones. The board, this is our time to listen to you folks, not for us to engage in dialogue uh, or question and answer. So we don't expect us to respond, we won't. Uh, and on a needed basis, the county manager will follow up, follow up with information or, or um, uh, at a later date. Speakers are limited to three minutes. And uh, La Bonita Bomar, our clerk of the board, has the timer and your timer's up here. So three minutes, it'll count down to zero and then It'll beep when you're done. If you are mid-sentence, we'll let you allow you to finish, of course, out of respect, but please do not take advantage of that and go on for another minute to two minutes. We're going to cut you off. You cannot donate your time to another uh, person. We reserve the right to restrict a person's opportunity to address the board for good cause. No comments that are lewd or offensive to a reasonable person. We ask you, please be respectful. No outbursts of any kind which is booing or hurrahing and, uh, and or applause. Please don't do that. It just takes more time. Um, and uh, no comments that are commercial in nature, such as your promotion for a for-profit business. <coughs> Nothing that's hurtful, hateful, inflammatory, defamatory, discriminatory. Any materials that anybody wants to supply to the county uh, may be considered public records subject to the public release upon uh, request pursuant to the Public Records Act 42.56 of the RCW. And I thank you all for your cooperation. Um, and again, address when you're coming to the uh, podium, address the board and not the audience. Don't address staff, or just address us, please. And the first one, I will call your name up and I will call uh, the next person up in the batter's box so you're ready to go. And the first uh, on the list is uh, Mayor Cheryl Selby from Olympia. And you have the floor, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chair Hutchings and Commissioners Edwards and Menser. I'm here to support your consideration and passage of the interim regulations and thereby changing your emergency homeless encampment regulations to provide a waiver of requirements during emergencies. I 
appreciate the steps you're taking to recognize that our region is experiencing unprecedented levels of homelessness. Olympia followed your lead in declaring a state of emergency last year. Since that time, we've also put in place emergency regulations for encampments. We opened our first low barrier mitigation site last winter and followed that up with Plum Street Village opening this spring. Plum Street Village is a temporary tiny home site that creates a higher level of accountability for its residents and it's showing early success with having residents getting back on track with their lives. I believe we're on to something in Olympia. We've now tested the model of providing a continuum of housing options that provides the low barrier stabilization piece first. There aren't many options for chronically homeless individuals to get a hand up and this is a key piece. It's a key that we screen in rather than screen out, and it's the model that, um, that we're using with great success. The downtown mitigation site has that low barrier to entry and uses a self-governance model. We've been able to demonstrate that once residents have a safe place to be, that they can begin to have hope for a better future and are more likely to be successful with more accountability. Our partners at the Union Gospel Mission have been critical to the mitigation site's success, and we now have a waiting list of street-dependent individuals that want to try a different path for their lives. There are no quick fixes to the systemic breakdown of our mental health, social safety nets, and economic systems that create huge wealth gaps. It took us a generation to get here, but I'm hoping with all of us pulling together that it won't take another generation to make homelessness a brief and infrequent experience. Let's get our county on track to obtain the functional net zero homelessness by the end of this decade. Passing this ordinance with the most flexible requirements for participation will be a large step forward in making that happen. I look forward to partnering with you going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I didn't, I didn't advise who's next. Council Member uh, Nathaniel Jones. Well, thank you and good afternoon. I am Nathaniel Jones. I'm a member of the Olympia City Council. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for having this public hearing. I've been actively involved in uh, developing Olympia's response to a public health emergency, that emergency associated with homelessness. And as you know, Olympia is focused on both short-term emergency actions and longer-term community-wide collaboration, which responds to a continuing and worsening human tragedy of many frail and needy people who haven't found stability or productive direction. Our planning, effort, our planning effort invites faith communities, nonprofits, businesses, citizens, and other governments into partnership, recognizing that this emergency requires a regional community response. It's larger than local government. It's a societal issue. I want to commend this commission for your efforts to advance the county's response and to work collaboratively across jurisdictions and across communities. The proposed ordinance that we're discussing today was born out of staff work that I delivered to you back in January. It was informed by a February 7th planning session which you held on, hom on homelessness, and it drew upon input from all three northern cities. And it's been available for public review for several weeks now. And I'm glad that we've reached this point in the discussion. You're aware that this proposal is not tied to any particular piece of property or to any one project proposal. It's essentially enabling legislation which allows for the development of more specific emergency housing strategies, strategies that will come back for your review and your approval. This ordinance should not be constrained by provisions which limit operational alternatives. The time for that comes down the road when a specific project is up for review. To be sure, you will want to be involved in decisions about any particular project that comes forward under this ordinance. You will want to establish performance expectations for any proposed operation. But the time for that comes later. This ordinance is essentially a land use ordinance that sets the stage for later decisions. I encourage you to promptly adopt the basic framework encouraging a regional community-wide response allowing the community to bring forward responsive project <coughs> proposals, proposals excuse me, and opening the door to far greater collaboration between our local governments and across communities. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Next up is Dennis Zek, followed by Max Denise. Thank you to the commissioners for the ability to speak today. 
I just want to reiterate from what I stated earlier, as it's become very evident by the uh, first three people that were up here. I feel the county commission is being pushed into moving forward with this to alleviate the pressure that the city of Olympia is sustaining with the homeless situation. We that live in the county don't agree with what's going on. I hope that you do not follow through with this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Max Dennis, or Denise rather, I'm sorry, and then uh, followed by Tony Wilson. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Max Denise. I live in the West Ridge Apartments in Tumwater. I'm a member of Just Housing, uh, a group that advocates for uh, housing and safe shelter for the homeless. Thank you for considering these actions uh, and for being an active participant in responding to this national, state, regional, and local crisis. Olympia needs your help, and uh, uh, it's very welcome. I learned a lot from Mr. Le Lefcourt's uh, presentation, so one of the things that I was going to, to uh, thank you for was for moving forward to uh, further reduce barriers, such as ID and background checks, but it appears to me from what Mr. Lefcourt says that that uh, you are not doing so in this uh, uh, ordinance that we're speaking about today. Even so, we thank you very much and we wish you good luck in all that you do. Thank you, sir. Tony Wilson followed by John Flory. Good afternoon, thank you for having this hearing today. <clears throat> I want to preface my, my remarks with, with a reality that um, this is not an Olympia problem. It's not a Thurston County problem. It's not Sacramento, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Albuquerque, Raleigh, Minneapolis, or Houston. It's a national problem. What we do here, though, can be a benchmark, a lesson in how to do it. And I think that this ordinance, with its time frame that's limited, and it's an opportunity to readdress the parameters every six months is very helpful. And I stand here from unincorporated South Thurston County, very nicely homed, and that's not always been the case. I've been on the other side of that line. And until you step over that line and, rec and live in a place where you can't bathe, you can't brush your teeth, you can't see a doctor or a dentist, and you can't eat, the parameters change dramatically on the other side of that line. Goal number one, get something to eat. The law doesn't matter anymore. How do I feed myself? How do I survive? And until I can stand in those shoes and recognize that problem, I cannot know what to do. I don't think the homeless community is one thing. We dismiss it as housed people, as the homeless, and that's it. There are homeless veterans, we should support them. They fought our wars. This isn't English, the, the British Empire of 1400. This is the United States of America today. Those veterans should not be homeless, whether they're addicted or not. We should be able to provide for them somehow. And I, I welcome this set of ordinances, this, the, this relief for these people, that now they can begin to look, as the mayor of Olympia said, at a more hopeful future and we can look that this mitigation site is not a place to put this many people forever, but a place where we can put this many people, address their needs, find what it is that they need, and move them in that direction and help them to find their way into reality, into the world that we all enjoy now. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Flory, followed by Ty Gundell. Good afternoon. I'm John Flory. I live in the South County off of Delphi Road. I am now retired for the last two years, but for 31 years before that, 
I drove around this county a lot. I was a large animal practitioner. And I've seen a, and heard a few people already comment that it's not a county problem. No, it's a county problem. And uh, I mean, I learned how to observe to be a veterinarian and drive around the county. There's tent encampments around the county. I know you folks know about ones that are on county property out there. I don't have to drive three miles from my house to see tents and talk to these people. Yes, it's real obvious down in Olympia, real obvious, especially when I walk by, there's a former client of mine. Why are they there? Why is she there with her two kids? Well, medical. That's what gets a lot of people. And it's, these are people. They're human beings. We need to be empathetic and we need to help them. This is the best plan in the 30 some years I've been here that I've heard about. We need the whole community. We need all of us to come together and help these folks because we can get a good percentage of them back in society. I'm not the one to do it. There's other people who are talking that know how to do it, but I'm willing to help. And I say, let's get this ordinance passed because as your county managers told you, it's step one. We got a long ways to go and let's do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. A Ty Gundell, uh, followed by either now, I have a question to ask because I've got both uh, Chloe, Chloe and uh, Gary Skinner that signed up but didn't check yes or no, so I'll offer you that opportunity if you want to speak, but Ty. Hi, my name is Ty Gundel and I'm an organizer with Just Housing. Um, I want to start by emphasizing just thank you for even taking the time to consider this ordinance. It's so encouraging to see the county continuing to step up again and again to become more involved in addressing this crisis. It's been said numerous times today already, we're only going to solve this if we're in this together. Um, I know this is very new. It's new for a lot of the local and government entities around here to be getting so involved in providing social services. Uh, we're, we're learning, and, and that's okay. Um, and I am one of the folks that um, hope that as we move forward, you'll consider continuing to lower barriers in this ordinance. But most importantly, I think it's um, we need to take this first step now. Um, as we move forward, I just want to encourage you all to remember a few things. One, we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, there's a lot of really um, intelligent, experienced, knowledgeable service providers and people on the ground who have been doing this for a long time. Lean on them. Um, also, just we are what we're dealing with is a homelessness crisis that's caused by social, economic, and housing failures. Um, I think it can be really tempting to set aside our own responsibility and accountability for supporting other community members in need by kind of pointing the folks on the streets as being the problem. Um, I think that becomes harder to do when you start to learn everybody's stories. Every story is different. Uh, the underlying connection is the systemic issues that are, that are causing this. Um, also, if we don't, this ordinance to me is about creating the opportunity for designating appropriate places for everyone in our community to find safe shelter. If we don't designate appropriate places for everyone, then there's only going to be inappropriate places. And that includes for folks with warrants, but folks with sex offenses and other criminal histories. Um, for me, when I think about these solutions and these steps that Olympia and the county are taking, I, I don't think about it as enabling um, substance use, poor lifestyle choices. I think about it as enabling people to stay alive that, that need our support. And I don't think there's, there's too much wrong with that. Um, and just, just on that, absolutely, um, we are also at the same time dealing with a substance use mental health crisis, um, but these are separate issues. The most recent national study on substance use disorders found that one in 10 people um, in America are, are dealing with a substance use disorder. Um, that means it's a house problem as much as it is an unhoused folks problem. Um, most importantly, it's been said a lot, people that are living on the streets and in the woods and in our camps are our community members. They're valuable community members and they're people that are taxpayers. They contribute to so many people's lives that I know and everyone in our community deserves a safe place to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. I have the Skinner family, uh, Chloe and Gary. And again, I don't, if you want to speak, please come up. If not, don't. Okay. Uh, another one uh, signed in. Thank you all for signing in. Let, you know, let us know that you're here for the record, but didn't check yes or no, and that's John Pettit, followed by Fred Silsby.
Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is John Pettit. I live in East Olympia. And as I mentioned before, there's a few salmon joining my house, so they're homeless too until today. Uh, but under the other issue here, I've addressed the City of Olympia Council numerous times. And it is absolutely correct to say it is a regional problem. It's not specific to Olympia. But it would also be uh, absolutely wrong to think that you can categorize all elements of homelessness into one category of a word homeless. And one of the reasons why different groups of people are homeless is some have significant addiction issues. And the reason why they're homeless is because maybe their home environment said, we've had enough, we can't live with you anymore. We don't want you stealing from us. You don't want us doing things. So having said that, and having had a history of myself, at my ranch having homeless people come and stay there because I, I believe in people giving them a hand up. I don't really believe in giving hand out, but a hand up. And I think one of the things that I see is as a community, as a regional, and I even told the Olympia City Council and the mayor and the pro tem at the time, I says, you know, this is really a health department issue. The health department for Thurston County should be dealing with the homeless issues. Now the ordinance you're considering obviously is, it appears to me from quick math was maybe the accommodations for 80 people, maybe two camps in all of unincorporated Thurston County. Probably not enough. We don't need people living in the woods. But I'm gonna attribute some of the issues back to the things I've mentioned before. We need to deal with the specific causes and the specific elements that make danger. And a high barrier is a better thing for those that are not in need of drugs. Let's make them safe and so we can help the mentally ill that need some help. Let's make the ones that are just down on their luck in better shape. Do I like a, an overall caveat? No, I, I don't oppose homelessness. I don't think anyone does. I oppose people stealing things from me. I oppose the idea of having a place where I can't trust to have my child go to a certain spot because the laws are not enforced. So I would say this, let's enforce all the laws fully. Let's make sure we don't say, okay, it's okay to use your stuff because we want you to come in. Let's help those that want to take the first step and make a commitment to following the laws, getting the help they need. Because if you don't do that, it's all going to be for nothing, and we're going to use resources on people that only want to get a benefit but not want to change their life to a better direction. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Silsby, followed by uh, Sherry Silverman. If the council will permit, I will yield my time to Kento Atagami from Sidewalk. That's fine. Thank you. I'll put negative here then. Thank you. Second sheet. Yep. So Sherry, uh, followed by Kento Azagami. Hi there. Hi. Can you lower that microphone right to your yes, face? There you go, ma'am. Thank you. I'm a short person. Hi there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I'm Sherry Silverman. I live in Olympia. Formerly, I lived on Franklin Street, and there were a lot of homeless people there. And very often, there would be this woman who was it's hard to tell by looking, but I would say she's probably at least in her early 60s. And she would want to sleep on my back porch, and I would always let her. Because I think it's tragic that you've got a woman who's that old, who's that vulnerable, who has no place to go. I am strongly in favor of this ordinance. I do think other things have to be addressed. The idea that was mentioned before is like, well, we don't want people living in the woods, so what are we going to do about those people? That does have to be addressed. I also think that we have to clean up a little bit uh, with the ID questions that were noted. I mean, how do we know which people have outstanding warrants or whatever? I think the fingerprint idea is a wonderful idea. But I, I am very strongly you know, in favor of this ordinance, and I just also want to say that I'm about this close to homelessness myself. People can become homeless for a variety of reasons. In my particular case, I am just living on Social Security. Currently, I'm living in a basement apartment, all right, because that's all I can afford. If it weren't for that, I'd be on the streets myself. And there's nothing wrong with me. It's just the way 
the economics of this country work sometimes. So um, again, I'm very much in favor of this ordinance. I do think that this will open the door to further discussion, as was noted before. I do think that there's further refinement that needs to be done, um, and perhaps some specifics that need to really be hammered down. But the first step is to pass this particular ordinance. I thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Kento, followed by Colin Forrest. Hi there, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Kento Azagami. I live in downtown Olympia, and I am on the I, I am a commissioner on the Olympia Planning Commission, um, and I was uh, there for the review of Olympia's uh, housing uh, emergency housing ordinance, uh, similar to what you're uh, talking about today. Um, I wanted to relate to you. So I am here in my own individual capacity, but I wanted to relate our experiences as we went through deliberations, specifically around the ID issue and about uh, permitting sex offenders and those with warrants into our camps. We ended up uh, removing. Uh, those uh, I, those provisions I, during debate. I mean, we all I felt I, we all kind of acknowledged that there was kind of an initial feeling of unsafety by openly permitting <clears throat> some I, somebody with uh, I, with a past criminal record and even sex offenses I, into uh, into one of these camps that might be bias. I, but uh, we went. I, but uh, we decided to push past those feelings and to look at the evidence. And we were able to come up with studies that were run by both the Colorado Department of Public Safety and the mini and the Minnesota Department. Department of Corrections I, that uh, both uh, showed that there was no causal link between uh, um, I, for the small minority of uh, sex offenders who do reoffend and uh, where they uh, where they lived, whether they lived in close proximity to a school or a park or anything like that. For any of those that did actually I, that it was related to like a school or a park, um, it, it, they actually went to, like a miles away from where they decided to I, to live. Um, so uh, the, in both instances, they really just found no cause of no uh, link uh, to any sort of concerns about living close to a, a certain site. Um, so I, for on, the, on that basis, we ended up uh, pulling that uh, during our uh, pulling that out of the ordinance uh, during our deliberations. Um, the other one that <clears throat> then we um, started to look at the uh, question about requiring ID and requiring background checks. And uh, during I, and during that uh, we. <clears throat> were guided by the agreement that the city of Olympia had signed uh, with the Interfaith Works Emergency Overnight Shelter, um, which has been open since I want to say 2014, um, and uh, has uh, um, a, right in downtown Olympia uh, on the corner of 7th and Franklin, um, and uh, they have never required uh, any of their shelter guests to provide ID. Um, I have to tell you, I live in downtown Olympia, and I have always, and I have usually lived within a couple of blocks of the Interfaith Works uh, Shelter, and I have never personally felt any sort of uh, I unsafe, like a uh, lack of safety in my neighborhood. Um, I actually kind of like walking through there, um, just because I know that there's always that there's. Uh, Oftentimes, somebody hanging out in the street, so I know that there's somebody else watching out, like on the off chance that I think that something is going to go down. Um, and I do, and you know, I'm 32, just about to turn 33, so like I am out and about at many different hours of the day throughout the neighborhood, and I, have, I and I have never personally felt any sort of weird uh, issues uh, based on that. So I had to have my own experience and say, if that's already going on here in our community, why I and it's fine. Why would we want to? I I like a. I bring it back from that. So we ended up removing it from I, that from our um, the ordinance as well, and I would urge you to do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Colin DeForest, followed by Robert Bruce. Good afternoon, commissioners. So um, I'm from the city of Olympia. Um, a lot of stuff's already been said, so I feel like I'll, I'll be repetitive. But a couple things that I wanted to touch on is, really there's been two mitigation sites in this near region, and I've been keyly involved with both of those mitigation sites. There was one in Tacoma two years ago, and really the success from that site in Tacoma, what led to a big transformation in visible street homelessness in Tacoma, and it also led to me coming down here to Olympia. Um, once again, I was key in being involved with the mitigation site at the city of Olympia, and um, a lot of that was put in place by the ordinance changes that we made in the revisions. Um, so I, I think the most important thing as we move forward is being flexible, understanding that you have the city of Olympia as a partner in this and that we are gonna be totally collaborative and a success for the county is gonna be a success for the city and the other cities also. Um, a couple things I would say is 
the goal of the mitigation side, I think it gets, it gets kind of bounced around. Is this a shelter? Is this permanent house? Like, what is this? The goal of the mitigation side, to be really clear, is we're trying to mitigate that human suffering and that, those health and safety issues that are going on in our community on a daily basis, right? So it's truly all about giving individuals the opportunity to take a positive step. That's the way that I look at it. I think you boil it down simply. When we had 300 tents in our downtown, we also didn't have a lot of opportunities outside of our shelters for individuals to take a positive, call it a baby step, call it what you want, but it's a positive step. For a lot of them, that's just not an opportunity that they have on a daily basis. So really it was, it was, it was, it was simple. Hey, are you interested in doing this? But with that being said, we can get caught up in the low barrier, no barrier, high barrier, whatever you want to call it. The reality is let's do as we've heard, let's do what we can to screen these individuals in. And I think you can look at it from the standpoint of sex offenders, people with records, people with warrants, the reality is these individuals are part of our community. They, I can guarantee one thing, they will be sleeping somewhere in our community tonight, tomorrow night, every night. And I think what the mitigation site does is it gives those individuals the opportunity and it lets us identify from a monitoring standpoint who really wants to participate and take that positive step and then focus on them. But really what it also does from a monitoring and enforcement standpoint is it lets us identify who doesn't want to take this positive step to get into this site that we're not asking a whole heck of a lot. For us in Olympia, it's being willing, willing to stay in a 10 by 10 site, be willing to take one of our tents and be willing to follow, follow some basic rules and not break the law. You can't drink drug or out, you can't use drugs or alcohol on site. Does it happen? Sure it does, it happens all the time. Do we enforce it when it happens? Most definitely we do. So um, I just say that. I think this is one of the ways as we move forward. Uh, go, ahead and finish your sentence. Your, go ahead and finish your sentence. I think this lets us assess what our real need is in our region and our community. Just as, this, as our first mitigation site let us do, we have 131 individuals there right now. And that, now we know we need more than that. So a second site will once again let us assess what the need is in the region. And it, to me, this is how we do not enable individuals. This is how we challenge individuals to step up. So All right. thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Colin. Robert Bruce followed by Boris Nelson. Hi, I'm Robert. Uh, I'm from Olympia. I volunteer with a group called Just Housing. Uh, we have a bunch of projects where like a group a mixture of people uh, with homes and people who are homeless and we have some projects where we work together and um, I feel like I've heard from a good amount of people who think that this is not like a homelessness crisis. This is like a personal responsibility type crisis and I, I really can't agree just from my experiences like working with well for example we have this project where we try to like provide like garbage pickup services at camps and residents of camps will like bag garbage and like we'll pick it up and take it to the to the dump and pay the dump fees and all that and um yeah i mean there are a lot of folks who are just like really struggling to survive out there and have like the character and like work ethic to like pick up their own stuff and also like pick up tons of stuff that's accumulated over many years or even decades on a site. Um, so I would say, I mean, just in these projects that I've been involved in, I see a lot of <clears throat> like seniors with health issues out there. I see a lot of people who um, got injured on the job and um, were given like opiates and developed like a substance use disorder. Um, I see a lot of folks who are like young and should be living with their parents, you know, in a, in a, in a better world where maybe their parents could care for them better. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think it's nonsense that, um, we would think of like a very like basic ordinance like this, which is meant to deal with like a state of emergency as enabling um, bad behavior. Uh, I mean, I, we, we know already this is a state of emergency and in other kinds of emergencies, you know, like natural disasters, that kind of thing. Like if we had something like that, we wouldn't, 
be screening people to like figure out what life choices they made and whether they had enough of a chance or not, we would see that they have some obvious crisis type issues. They are in a state of emergency. They need housing. They have health problems that haven't been addressed for a long time and are very serious. Um, they have substance use disorders that they need help with, honestly, a medical response to. Um, and, uh, you know, in other types of emergencies, we would simply see those obvious things that people are in crisis and we would, we would help them before, you know, I mean, we wouldn't consider doing that kind of like testing or that kind of thing. We would, we would, yeah. So I think we should take the same approach here um, and support kind of like a low barrier solution that deals with people in an emergency situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Boris Nelson, it's been a minute. Yeah, followed by Bodika Walsh. Hi, so bear with me on my notes here. Um, so I'm Boris Nelson, I've lived here my entire life, 51. Uh, I've been right here in Olympia. John, you gave me my first speeding ticket. Uh, <laughs> I'm not good to, to see you again. I'm not supposed to respond. <laughs> um, I don't want to. I live in the county, and I believe that I speak for a lot of people that are my neighbors that uh, just either didn't have the time to come today, or know about it, or, or whatever they're doing. Um, over the course of my life, I've watched our community deteriorate in many different ways, and it's uh, it's sad. You know, when I was a kid and I was 13 or 14 years old, I'd tell my mom I'd be back later. I'd leave on a Saturday, I'd run around the Capitol campus trying to not get in too much trouble, but she'd have no idea where I was at and I'd show back up at dark and everything was good. Today, I track my kids like there's no tomorrow. I see where they're at <laughs> on their cell phones and I don't even let them go down the Shehales Western Trail by themselves. And that's the difference of what is going on around us right now. Uh, I think that everything is these good intentions and these camps uh, serve a purpose. Unfortunately, we're at a situation where you have to consider doing things like this. What I feel like is going on here is uh, the model seems to be, let's just try to patch the holes in the ship just slightly faster than they're being drilled. And I don't think that's really a long-term solution. I think, unfortunately, it does enable people to not follow through on multiple levels of what's going on here. If you open up these camps and you have a, a, a set of rules that these people are to follow, that's great. We, we want to help these people transition from a position of, of unfortunate homelessness to a productive something for, them, for themselves. Uh, but if they don't meet the criteria, uh, the answer was not answer. Where do they go? That was an answer, a question you asked, and uh, there is no answer to that. They simply drift back into the woods in your backyard. And that's because they don't want to follow these rules, and so you've either got mental health issues, drug issues, or just people that have found themselves in a bad situation. I think people in a bad situation will want to help themselves. I think addicts do not want to help themselves or don't know how unless they get the proper help. And mental uh, health situations, they need help. Uh, they're unable in some ways to, to help themselves. So they almost need an institution to help them regulate medications or whatever they need. But all those things are outside of a camp's control. And so if anybody shows up to these camps, which is that's great that that's happening, and then they're not admitted or they're turned away, where do they go? So before you start adapting ordinance waivers to relax restrictions to make things easier, why can't we take care of other problems that are simultaneously happening in our community? Uh, there is a safety and, and health crisis going on all around us with things like the jungle and uh, rampant drug use in downtown Olympia and all around. It's, those laws are not being enforced because there's nowhere to put these people or whatever the reason is. I don't let my kids go downtown and go under the bridge and take pictures like they want to and do those things. All the things that I could do as a kid because those laws are not being enforced. And until you start enforcing those laws and you start addressing where do they go when they don't adhere to the rules at the camps, what are you really doing? So I don't know why we address those waivers until we already also simultaneously take action on the other stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Brees. Uh, Budika, followed by uh, Walker Stevens. Hello, my name is Budika Walsh. Um, I am a mentally ill, formerly homeless trans woman from the northwest uh, side of Olympia. Um, and I'm here asking for a low barrier <laughs> mitigation sites because if I didn't have a couch to sleep on, thanks to friends of mine, I would have needed one or I would be dead. Um, one of the many things that I am is a poet. And I have a piece I'd like to read. It's called 50 Yards. I want to tell you the story of Karen Broca's disappearance. She was 63. She was evicted by Thurston County Sheriff's a year ago, 
had nowhere to go. Her last will and testament was, please take care of my cat. She went into the woods and never came back. Her remains were found 50 yards in from the 2200 block off of Harrison. 50 yards. 50 yards into the abyss, into the untamed and neglected woods. 50 yards to be forgotten about for a year, to end up as dental records in a coroner's report. 50 yards into the woods, now just two yards down. 50 yards into the dystopian wilds is 150 feet left to the wolves, tenebrous creatures that deal in human souls, addicting the desperate to drugs, turning into trade, the young and delectable, starving the erstwhile unappetizing, if not visiting even more vulgar tendencies upon them. 50 yards. How long or wide is the mitigation site in Olympia? Is it more or less than 50 yards? They are, they are yards empty of needles, yards of safety and light, yards where sleep is had at night because of quiet hours, where relief is possible and toilets are available. 50 yards. How long is a rope on a buoy tossed into nebulous waves? 50 yards from the mitigation site is a food bank, a clinic, a clothing bank, a bus station, a city, a community, eyes and ears. But a year ago, there was zero yards of mitigation site. And so all she could do was go 50 yards into unbridled woods. 50 yards, and she wasn't found for a year. 50 yards and 11 months, no one knowing where she was. But how many were looking, and how far did they search? 50 yards into oblivion. How many have gone, are gone, will go into those 50 yards? How many more will need to go those 50 yards before we give them a better direction to go? Only the light of community can dissipate the shroud of gloaming chaos that sweeps up the beleaguered and hopeless. Those who with nowhere to go, only 50 yards was enough to obliterate Karen. Only 50 yards erased her memory for a year. 50 yards as deep and voiduous as a black hole. How many yards would she have gone if there had been a safe place for her to go? How many yards will you give to save lives today? Thank you. Uh, I've got Walker Stevens uh, followed by Greg Mueller. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you for having us all be able to speak today, and it's really a pleasure to hear my community speak. My name is Walker. I was born at St. Pete's Hospital, and I grew up going to North Thurston School District. Um, I'm here today to support the changes in these ordinances because they're really life-saving, right? Like, we're really talking about human beings living and dying in the woods on the streets, um, and we're legislating ways to make that more difficult. Um, a few years ago, I started an organization that we pay homeless people every Christmas to make Christmas wreaths. Uh, and to date, we've hired, we've employed like over 300 people. Uh, people are very eager to work when given a chance and opportunity. I'm also an avid community gardener. I run a community garden in East Olympia that is a really beautiful space. We have music events, we have community events, Easter egg hunts haunted house, um, and I do other things too. I'm, I'm a part of this community, I love this community. I also can't afford to pay rent, um, so I live in a van. Um, and there's, there's challenges that go with that, right? Like it's cold, it's wet, it's pain in the butt to go to the bathroom. These are realities for me. And then there's this added reality where it's like, that's illegal, your lifestyle is illegal. And when you, eat, when you make someone's lifestyle illegal, when you push someone into the woods or into unregulated camps on the streets, like other speakers have said today, they don't go away. These problems don't go away. It just creates a huge, huge, huge level of internal burden and external burden and just all these extra complications in life that's like, man, my life is illegal. This is not conducive to getting back on my feet. This is not conducive to, to recovery when, when, when you're told that your existence is not legal because that's what it is. That's the reality, right? If you can't afford to live somewhere for whatever reason. Substance abuse has been touched on. You know, also just rent has exploded in my lifetime growing up in this county. I work, I have two part-time jobs and I can't afford to pay rent and that puts me in this huge category of people that the state sees as homeless and illegal. And what, what you're voting on or what, what this resolution is, is a small step in the direction of saying we value you, you're part of our community because I am a part of this community. I do things that I'm proud of. You know, I spend a lot of time, one of the reasons why I can't pay rent is I spend a lot of time babysitting um, children for a friend of mine who uh, can't afford 
child care, you know, like uh, me and a lot of other people on the streets, a lot of people experiencing homelessness are not trash people to be to be kicked away, to be all generalized as like, oh, street people on drugs and having all kinds of problems. And, and that's not to say that people on drugs don't also deserve to have a place to sleep that's legal. And, and, and that's a fundamental part of existence. Thank you. Greg Mueller. And then uh, the final one that has signed up, and I'll get to everybody else in case you want to uh, speak, uh, is Sharon. But I cannot read the last name, so I'm not even going to try. But it doesn't say whether you want to speak or not, ma'am, so I'll let you choose. OK, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, thank thank you. you. As the first speaker mentioned, the main point of this ordinance is about safety. Uh, the problem is when the location picked, this ordinance will apply to everywhere. And that essentially is not safe. There's lots of places where this ordinance would, wouldn't apply to and shouldn't, but is being broadcast with no restrictions. Similar to the 502, <clears throat> I-502 that got passed, there'd be some restrictions with regards to not being placed near child care centers or schools. It's just too broad of a overall approval to let it happen anywhere. That should be considered. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, Sharon, yay. I'll check yes. It's Tobble. I'm sorry? Sharon Tobble. Okay, thank you. Can I put a question mark because I wasn't sure exactly what to say. I think I'll end with a note it was almost me nine months ago homeless and maybe you'll listen to me because i look like most of you um a lot of trauma and a lot of people on the street have a trauma background and it's what eases the pain you know and the addiction feeds the addictions and causes the problem that the rest of the community sees. Please remember that they're human beings, no matter what they're doing or done or what stage they're at. And we, we have lived in a society with laws. But what good is that law over a human life? So please think about that when you vote on this. Thank you. That uh, depletes the people that have signed up. However, if uh, Jeremy, is there nothing else? If anybody would like to address uh, the board uh, that hasn't had a chance to sign up, please come on up. You have an opportunity now to. Yes, ma'am. But you're going to have to repeat your name for me. Okay. Hi, my name is Lisa Gelati, Thank and um, I founded a nonprofit last year called Build a Bus Home. And the intention is to help people like myself in low income, no income, find a home at a low price. So I've done a lot of research in this year, and I've learned a lot. I just came across a organization in Austin, Texas called Mobile Loaves and Fishes. It is mlf.org. They are a community of people that were formerly homeless. They've created a community. When we grow up in life, we have family. We have parents. Some, some do, some don't. But we live for community. It's part of what we are. We need safety. We need shelter. We need water, food. And we need a home. We need community around all that. And that's what Mobile Loaves and Fishes has done. And we are starting a um, hygiene services, mobile hygiene. And it's called Clean Up Bus. We've got a trailer. We're working on uh, getting it ready. We want to be part of the solution in the bigger picture and create community. And I myself vow to take that step. If you need a nonprofit to, to call on, please call on us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board on this issue? Yes, sir, way in the back and then uh, you, young man. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Wade Keekafer, and I've lived here all my life, well, since high school. You're going to have to do that for me again. Is it Wade? Wade Keekafer. Okay, thank you. And I taught school for 32 years, you know, helping kids and parents. <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, you can enable people and uh, or you can make them work and have pride in what they do. And I don't see a lot of that happen in Seattle or San Francisco. And, uh, and there's a crime element. And I wish that we would do something to keep everybody safe, help the homeless, mentally ill, but also keep people accountable for their actions. And I don't see that happening. And I wish it did. I talked to business people downtown Olympia, and they see the same thing. So that's my God. If, if you, I want you to keep your standards really high uh, for this ordinance. But I'd also like you to have it so you keep everyone safe. You know, homeowners, businesses, and the mentally ill, and people that are homeless. Because I think all can be done. Eric Johnson put out a program, Seattle is Dying. <clears throat> and he brought that to light. And he came up with an answer. I think he went to Rhode Island and did the research there and found that uh, people were held accountable for their actions. They could go to jail, but then they got a choice. Do they want to be in this program? And the program really helped them, and they have a pretty good success rate. But, you know, I agree with Greg, who just spoke a minute ago, about, you know, you select a location where they have services available to them. And I know the one out by South Bay has, there's no bus services there. So I would keep it close to the city or where they can get those services. I think that's important. But thank you. Thank you, sir. And next we have. Thank you. Uh, my name is Regan Unsold, R-E-G-O-N-U-N-S-O-E-L-D. Uh, Long-time resident in the community, taught high school soul studies in Tumwater uh, for 30 years. And I'm a volunteer with Just Housing. And I want to talk a little bit about mitigation sites. Um, one of the things that uh, Just Housing believes is that uh, sweeping camps when there's no safe, legal, or appropriate alternative simply moves the problem around. It's a poor use of resources. And we've maintained that, that all efforts should be made to find safe, legal, and appropriate sites before camps are removed. What do I mean by appropriate? Offering someone a vacant bed in an overnight shelter for someone who has a camp with camp stove, sleeping gear, et cetera, et cetera, is not what I would call appropriate. Um, you're not able to take those belongings into the overnight shelter with you. There's inadequate storage, secure storage. Belongings are lost. Um, one of the other things that I see happening in a lot of the sweeps of camps is that the small micro communities, a lot of the camps, people on the outside may th see them as sort of uh, monolithic, but they're really often small subgroups within those camps of people who've come together, help each other, look out for each other, and those also get scattered to the wind. So the city of Olympia has historically uh, had a pretty robust practice of sweeping camps that establish on public property. Last September, the uh, Ninth Circuit decision, Martin versus Boise, uh, declared that public entities could not, should not uh, sweep camps, prosecute uh, people, trespass people, unless the city had legal alternatives to offer. And the city at the time had posted three downtown camps for clearance, and those were put on hold as the city scrambled to come up with mitigation site. And let me just say that I commend the city of Olympia for much of the efforts that they've made on behalf of the houseless community. Um, remarkable for a city its size. Um, so the mitigation site was created. And we who've been actively providing direct support for camps in the downtown area we're told by the city that no further sweeps would take place until there was a second mitigation site. And then there was a subsequent decision that came out of Oakland, in which the city of Oakland was basically given a pass as long as there were vacant beds and shelters. 
sweeps could resume. And the policy of the city of Olympia now is to resume sweeps using best practices. Not clear what that is. Um, however, it led to the sweep of Smart Lot, the large unmanaged site downtown. Uh, morning after 17 degree low temperature, they were swept. And that's still the policy. It's not clear that the city of Olympia is continuing to look for a second mitigation site within city property, so we're looking to the county um, to provide not only a place for people to be safe and appropriate, but also, and I'll, I'll just quote a fellow by the name of Jeremy Scott. He was a resident of Smart Lot. Thank you for the extra 30 seconds. Um, and he said to me one day, Regan, we need to be helping people in these camps find reasons to live and not simply provide them with the barest necessities to exist from day to day. And that has resonated with me. Yes, we need the safe places to exist from day to day, but we've got to be offering more, a basis of hope. And I look to the county for assistance in this area at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the uh, board? Yes, sir. Yes. My name is John Shriver. Uh, my name is on that list, and I, I marked uh, not to speak initially, but I'd like to now. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to say is that um, I don't have any issue with uh, the mitigated sites that, that, that have been opened up, um, and I would certainly support the uh, uh, adding other sites uh, to the, the county to, to enjoy, uh, address the problems that we have. Um, but uh, my, my, my biggest fear is that by lowering the standards that for people to enter these camps, um, just uh, continues to enable the problem that we have with the people that don't go to the camps on their own, um, the, the spaces that we have right now. We, there is multiple camps um, throughout the county. Um, I live in the Northeast County and there's camps out that way, uh, by our house out there. and. Um, we keep trying to say these are, this is a homeless issue. The homeless issues have been going on for decades, um, but with really with the problem, the current problem that, that that's out there right now is the is the drug addiction, and uh, we can't take our kids to the parks anywhere around here because of this, and uh, we spend a lot of try to spend a lot of time downtown, but we can't do it at night anymore because of those issues. And so really what I, what I would like to ask for is if before we lower standards, I support what Brees Nelson said, is that if we can actually go back to supporting our, and enforcing our county uh, laws that we already have and ordinances in place to address, address the drug addiction problems that are out there and making the streets safe again and the parks safe again for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? No. Good, thank you. Um, then, uh, I declare this public hearing over. And what is the pleasure of the board? I think we're going to discuss this quite a bit before I'm ready to take a vote. No, I'm not right there. Uh, uh, recommend for you to move to close the public hearing. Okay. I would move to close this public hearing. Oh, there we go. Okay, close. Second. And second. And moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 And now what? Move to adjourn? Well, I think we're just adjourned. Yep, we're adjourned. Yeah, I, I, will, I will schedule a follow up uh, uh, work session with you based on the testimony that you receive and perhaps some um, suggestions the staff is going to bring forward as to how you may consider uh, addressing the ordinance. And at that time, uh, then uh, after that discussion, then I will put this item on your board agenda if, if that is the case for you to take a formal action. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. We're adjourned.